Veritasium did an excellent segment recently. Today we're diving deeper, showing what actually happened during the demo and what telcos can do to prevent that type of hacking. SS7 enables different abuse scenarios, location tracking and intercepting somebody's call or text message. The SS7 hacker has a choice of dozens of different messages that you can somehow stitch together. These issues have been known for a long time. Hi, this is Carsten from Hacking Matters, where each week we look at hacking techniques. Today, we're diving into telco hacking, how to intercept phone calls, read people's SMS, or disrupt networks. Specifically, we look at SS7 hacking, a hacking technique that's been literally around for decades and that still prevails in too many networks. Veritasium did an excellent segment recently, and based on popular demand, today we're diving deeper, showing what actually happened during the demo and what telcos can do to prevent that type of hacking. SS7 is a network that spans the globe, like the internet, and that connects different telcos. You, as a phone user, will never connect directly to the SS7 network, and neither will your phone, but the telcos between them exchange information over SS7, and a couple of other technologies. And SS7 is the most vulnerable of those. So when you're roaming, for instance, information is exchanged over SS7. When you're sending a text message from one network to another, it could be exchanged over SS7 and a few other scenarios. So this is an old network that was introduced with GSM 2G back in the 80s in many countries, but that still prevails today because it's the smallest common denominator of networks it's basically the technology that works. We're all newer standards. Some telcos have them, some telcos don't have them. It's not quite as universal. SS7, in a sense, is similar to IP version 4, an ancient technology that people have declared outdated for decades and that yet we can't seem to get rid of moving on to more secure or at least more modern technologies. So for the moment, every phone user is affected by SS7 in some ways. SS7 enables different abuse scenarios. We're only going to dive into two today, location tracking and intercepting somebody's call or text message. The others being you can take down parts of networks, you can commit fraud on networks. We're not gonna look at those though today, but if you're interested, there is a lot of research, of course, back from 2014, 2015, when these issues were widely publicized and talked about, and the insights haven't really changed since then. So going into the first risk scenario, location tracking. Any participant on the SS7 network can send messages to any telco asking for a subscriber's location. The request is called Anytime Interrogation, or short ATI, and that request really just gives somebody's phone number as a parameter and receives back where is that person in the world right now. Fortunately, this specific request is blocked in almost all SS7 networks these days because people have understood that it's virtually only used for abuse. There is no reason to send this message from one network to another. But there's other messages that you can't block quite as easily because they have useful functionality and put together, those messages achieve exactly the same. For instance, there's a request called a SRI, which translates a phone number into an IMSI. It's basically the serial number of your SIM card. And then there's another request called the PSI that translates that IMSI into somebody's location. So two step to basically get the same result, going from a phone number to somebody's whereabouts. And then there's a, a number of other messages that you can use and stitch together to have that location revealing effect. Just like with the anytime interrogation request, telcos of course have the option of blocking those, but the more useful the message is for everyday operations of the network, the more difficult it is to configure the firewalls to get it exactly right. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Let's dive into the second abuse scenario, reading some of these text messages or listening to the phone calls, which is what Veritasium recently showed. Here again, the SS7 hacker has a choice of dozens of different messages that you can somehow stitch together to either be in the middle of a phone conversation or to receive information that wasn't meant for you but for your target. The easiest to execute abuse case is for the SS7 hacker to send to the network saying, your subscriber is here now. 
I'm a different country. He's roaming in my country. If anyone calls him or sends him a text message, please send it here. I'll get it to the subscriber. And in cases where you want to just listen into a phone call, what you do is you receive the phone call and immediately unregister from the home network so that the home network again feels responsible for the subscriber and then create a second phone call reaching that original subscriber. They are picking up the phone call and you're connecting the one that was forwarded to you to the one you initiated. So the original caller speaks to your target, but you're sitting in the middle. You're hearing everything that they're saying. This again can be prevented at some effort. For instance, it's suspicious for somebody to be in this country and then in that country seconds later, but not every network looks at this. Again, we'll, we'll come back to defenses in a little bit. Let's look at the second possibility for intercept, which is the one that Veritasium showed. And this one somewhat ironically abuses a security functionality, but in this case, a fraud prevention technology. Phone calls and text messages can be expensive, especially to roaming numbers. So there's a functionality called camel, like the animal, that over SS7, you can configure what somebody is allowed to call and what they're not allowed to call. The functionality also allows for number rewriting. So if you're trying to call one number, it's instead redirecting you to another number. This, for instance, is useful if you're missing out the country code and you're in a roaming scenario. So instead of accidentally calling somebody in the country you're visiting, it instead adds the country code and makes you call in your home country. So this overall protocol, the CAMEL protocol, can now be abused by the hacker registering as the CAMEL server, basically saying, whenever this person makes a phone call, ask me first. I'll tell you whom they actually try to call. You can see how, once again, this allows the hacker to sit in the middle of a phone conversation by redirecting all the phone calls to themselves and then initiating second phone calls to the intended call party and connecting those together. So by abusing what was meant as a fraud prevention technology, the hacker can now spy on phone conversations. These issues have been known for a long time and in 2014, 2015 were widely discussed as security researchers like ourselves showed publicly that they're possible. SS7 hacking is still possible in many networks, so you can't help but wonder what can networks do to prevent this kind of abuse? And the simple answer is firewalls. In this case, SS7 firewalls were functionally not that different from internet firewalls. In fact, like we said, SS7 is like the internet, a global network where different parties exchange information, but not everyone wants to accept every message from everyone else. Configuring those firewalls is in the first step relatively straightforward. We're talking about category one SS7 messages that have no right to be exchanged between different networks. So your SS7 firewall can just flat out refuse those messages. That, for instance, prevents the ATI, the easiest way to track somebody's location. There are also category two and three messages and are a little bit harder to filter because you can't flat out block them because sometimes they're needed to run your network. They needed to send text messages, they are needed to allow roaming and many other use cases. A first order approximation is only exchange those messages with parties that you're doing business with. So for instance, in a roaming scenario, your customers are allowed onto certain networks, but not other networks. If you are a traveler, you've experienced that. So don't exchange messages with parties that you don't have roaming agreements with. Maintaining those lists, of course, is difficult. You can have hundreds of roaming agreements and each of your roaming partners might have different SS7 addresses and in fact changing SS7 addresses. So this is as difficult as maintaining a complex internet firewall rule set. And then the category three messages make it even more difficult because they are context dependent. They would, for instance, trigger on things like somebody is in one country one minute and then in another country moments later. Now that's possible if these two countries share a border. It's not possible if they're far away from one another. So again, the firewall has to include all of this context and decide whether a request is legitimate. Now these are the advanced topics in SS7 defense. Even just blocking 
category one and starting to block category two messages though would really move us forward in SS7 security. When the European Union's security agency ENISA asked a few years ago to all the telcos in the European Union, are you doing something about SS7 security? Only about 40% of them had started taking action. This is years after the vulnerabilities had been disclosed publicly and literally decades after the vulnerabilities had been created. Less than half of the networks had started taking action. And I would imagine that the rest of the world doesn't look any better. European networks are no less, possibly even more concerned with customer privacy. And if they don't take action, this is a global problem that needs addressing. My personal opinion on why these issues aren't being addressed is that telcos have little to gain. Their customers are not running away because of SS7 problems. They're not flocking to the most secure networks. We are considering networks more and more just a base infrastructure to exchange information. And as long as it's doing that, we think we're secure with secure messaging apps, with encrypted file exchange. But we forget that the network knows our location and might disclose it to third parties. We forget that we still depend on two-factor authentication through SMS to secure many of our internet properties. So we do rely on networks for the security. We don't choose secure networks with our wallets, thereby creating incentives for telcos to invest into security sufficiently. I've been working with my team on addressing this, but just drop in the ocean. There are hundreds of telcos in the world. We can't work with all of them, but hopefully some of you feel inspired, take action as a customer or as a security professional at a telco. Reach out or comment below if there are any open questions on how to get this done. And hopefully we can push the envelope a little bit further. Also let us know whether these deep dive sessions into specific technology subjects are up your alley or whether you prefer the broader content we usually share on the channel. The channel is evolving and growing, so we'd love your feedback on any of those questions. Appreciate you being here with us. Um, if you appreciate us equally, show it with a like and subscribe and we'll see you next week. Happy hacking.